Chapter 19 focuses on equivalence-based instruction, or EBI, and equivalence-based instruction, or what we'll soon learn is um, stimulus equivalence, is probably one of the more difficult areas in behavior analysis to comprehend. So um, bear with me as I go through this chapter. The content, again, is, is just very dense. There's a lot of notation to follow. But I think you'll find if you go through it a couple times, listen carefully, read through the chapter carefully, you'll find that it is pretty straightforward material, uh, as long as you break it down into manageable sections. The first thing I would encourage you to do is go through the introduction, the first couple pages of the chapter, and revisit the vignette uh, just as a way to sort of try to relate the author's description of um, his everyday life and the, the importance of symbols in one's life to your own life. And I think what you'll start to find is that uh, behavior analysis expands well beyond the work that we do with children with autism and developmental disabilities, um, behavior management. It, it really permeates our everyday life. So, you know, again, behavior analysis is really derived from learning theory. It is the uh, psychology of behavior, the science of behavior for all organisms. It is a way in which we learn as humans. And I think this section will highlight some of the uh, complexities of human behavior and how we can move from simple operant conditioning you know, within a three-term contingency uh, to account for more complex behavior like language. So we're going to discuss stimulus equivalence and uh, one of the, the things I want you to think about as we go through this chapter is how we're going to apply these concepts or what we'll learn uh, as a methodology to arrange teaching, right? So if you're teaching a learner with autism to um, form conditional discriminations, uh, how can we arrange our teaching in a way that will maximize the learning outcomes? Right. So in other words, what we'll see is we can arrange teaching in such a way that we teach a little or a few relationships, but the outcome is um, well beyond what we've taught. So the term stimulus equivalence simply means that the presentation of one stimulus occasions responses to other stimulus classes. And a stimulus class is basically a set of stimuli that have the same effect on behavior. So for example, various shades of the color blue have the same effect of us calling it blue. Other examples might include that uh, if you're teaching a student that a specific flag equals a specific country, you're teaching a relationship between two sets of stimuli that uh, a flag with um, red, white stripes, blue field and stars equals the United States, right? As opposed to other flags equaling other countries. So those are some simple examples, but again, we could get into more complex um, academic material like teaching children to read um, words, sight words, or teaching them to respond to spoken words in particular ways teaching them that pictures of animals equal this, the word animals or equals the, the verbal response animal. So uh, we could get really complex. And as you start to go through the chapter, you see that some of the research has started to address some more complex behavior. So again, uh, matching to sample comes up in this chapter. We covered it in the chapter on stimulus control. Uh, in the context of discussing conditional discrimination. So the procedure, as described by Maury Sidman, is basically a discrete trial procedure. Now, again, I don't think we talked about discrete trial explicitly. I do believe we mentioned it. Uh, you could think of it, again, as a teaching format, <clears throat> wherein the, the teacher presents uh, a discriminative stimulus, maybe some instructional materials, as well as a verbal instruction, waits for the learner to respond, uh, contingent on correct responses, reinforcements delivered, contingent on incorrect responses. Maybe there's some uh, 
uh, error correction procedure or perhaps extinction. There is an inter-trial interval during which the uh, instructor collects some data and then a new trial begins. So match to sample is a discrete trial teaching procedure. So the, the work is done in a trial format and the trial, or at least during each trial, what happens is the teacher will present a sample stimulus in the example I have here. It is a picture of a cat <clears throat> and the learner will admit an observing response of some sort. So it might be that they touch the sample stimulus, right? So the, um, the learner touches the sample and then the teacher will present comparison stimuli, usually an array of three, right? So I present the sample, the learner touches it, then I lay out these three pictures. And the correct response will be for the learner to uh, match either by pointing or uh, matching the picture to the picture. Often a point response is used, and we're not really going to go into the details of that in this class, but I will, will tell you that particularly in um, early intervention work, a point response is often used because it has a lot of generality to other academic tasks. So rather than say, hand me the uh, correct picture or hand me the cat or match the picture, it's often point because again, we could use a point response for a lot of other things. And uh, again, across trials, <clears throat> you'll see a variations of this procedure where uh, these, the comparison stimuli are certainly alternated in a left right format or quasi randomly. Uh, also, it's not uh, uncommon or actually it's recommended that each of these comparisons serve as the sample stimulus on trial to trial. So for example, this may be trial one, sample of a cat, you point to cat. Trial two might be the sample of the rabbit, you point to rabbit, and then trial three might be the sample of the dog or some, uh, again, quasi random format of alternating samples. So once again, when a correct response occurs, uh, <clears throat> when, or when the correct comparison matches the sample, reinforcement will be delivered. And as I mentioned, the samples alternated across trials. And matching the sample is sort of a four-term contingency. There are two antecedent stimuli, uh, the, the correct comparison selection response, and then a reinforcer. And we would say that the learner has acquired a conditional discrimination, right? Because the correct response depends on um, not only the sample, what the teacher requires, touch cat, right? So there's, uh, again, another uh, discrimination to be made. And then they have to learn that these are incorrect as well. <clears throat> Often when matched sample work is being done or the research is being done, there are two forms of matching that, that typically will occur. Identity matching and symbolic matching. In identity matching, the sample stimulus is presented followed by comparison stimuli and the uh, learner will match the identical form of the stimulus, right? So in a, a identity matching, we might run a procedure where picture is matched to picture, right? So they're the same stimulus class, pictures, okay? Keep that in mind. In symbolic matching, sort of the same procedure, but the, um, the stimuli are arbitrary relationships, right? Or symbolic relationships. So we might present the word as a sample, right? Maybe the written word cat on an index card but the comparison stimuli are pictures. So we're, we're matching word to pictures. We could do a variety of uh, other manipulations. We could do pictures to words. We could do spoken word to picture, right? So point to cat, <clears throat> and that the sample in that case is the verbal uh, SD cat. Okay, so here's an example of identity matching, right? These are exactly the same. Right, we're matching cat to cat. Here, it's symbolic matching, right? The picture 
to the written word. Now, again, this is not the the exact format. It doesn't have to be picture to written word. We could go written word to picture or uh, spoken sample to words or spoken sample to pictures. So a variety of permutations can be delivered in this matched sample format. And you could see, obviously, in this case, um, <clears throat> identity matching is, is fairly basic. Symbolic matching is more aligned with our, our everyday life in terms of language and the meaning of symbols and, and so forth. The other thing I'll, I'll uh, mention that is interesting to think about is often in behavior analysis, we kind of focus on these one-to-one -one relationships that in the presence of an antecedent stimulus, a response is reinforced. Uh, and, and often you might hear other disciplines critique that as how can that, that approach or conceptual theory account for the complexities of human behavior? Well, in this uh, stimulus equivalence theory, we are starting to get into the more complex aspects of human behavior. And in some case, uh, in uh, some writings, this is used to sort of explain how children, as they're acquiring language, go from acquiring these sort of few words here and there to what is typically referred to as an explosion in language, that they go from knowing a few words to suddenly knowing a lot of different words. <clears throat> so when you're running through these match to sample procedures, uh, either identity matching or symbolic matching, that is the teaching procedure, right? Or that is a procedure researchers are using uh, to eventually test for what are called emergent stimulus relations or derived stimulus relations. So uh, we're going to conduct probe trials after our teaching trials. And the probe trials include new combinations of sample and comparison stimuli. Now, again, not completely new, uh, just different variation, different presentation methods of the stimuli that you were using in your initial match to sample procedure. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll go through some examples if this is not clear yet. So what we're looking for in these equivalence relationships is that the presentation of one stimulus occasions responses to other stimulus classes. And you know, I, I mentioned by way of the examples here, um, flag to countries or country to flag or written word country to shape of country. Now, again, we could do a lot of different permutations of this. So when we're doing this match to sample or stimulus equivalence training, what we're looking for is we're teaching uh, certain relationships, but then we're going to test the participant on uh, not only the trained relationships, but new relationships that were not explicitly trained. And this is where it gets confusing for, for some. When we go through these examples, we're going to use a notation, A and B. These are simply referring to the stimulus uh, classes being used. So it could be A is pictures and B is written words. You know, here, written words to um, spoken word, a, couple, you know, a variety of different variations. So what we're going to look for is that if we arrange teaching in a particular way, teaching A to B and B to C, do we get other relationships that were not explicitly taught? So do we get emergent relationships? So for example, if we were to teach the spoken word cat equals a picture of a cat, again, using the matching the sample procedure, the teacher uh, presents the sample spoken word cat uh, and lays out the comparison stimuli and they are pictures and if the learner touches the picture of a cat, reinforcements delivered. Then the teacher can present the picture as the sample and uh, written words as a comparison stimuli. And again, we're running through multiple trials. Um, picture, teacher shows a picture of cat, lays out the written word, you know, cat, dog, whatever, uh, and the correct response is touching cat. So if we teach these, it stands to reason that the learner should be able to demonstrate other relationships that were not explicitly taught. 
So uh, we might run a probe trial where the teacher presents the spoken word cat and the comparison stimuli are written words, one being cat, right? So now, again, we didn't teach that relationship, right? We taught spoken word to picture, picture to written word, but there is a relationship in what we taught. So we might see that there's this uh, emergent relationship that now the learner can correctly identify or discriminate spoken word cat and written words. Okay, so again, that, that's why I mentioned we want to consider this not only an area of research, it's starting to really emerge as, as um, teaching practices that we're trying to arrange teaching, specifically if we're using a matching a sample format, in a way that's going to maximize learning outcomes. And really what we're teaching is uh, relationships among various stimulus classes, right? Spoken word to picture, you know, spoken, sp spoken words are a stimulus class, pictures are a stimulus class, pictures to written words, a new stimulus class. So these, these uh, different classes of stimuli share the common effect on behavior, right? So it's the same behavior. Um, th in other words, we might even think of the uh, learner as acquiring a concept. <clears throat> okay, so here's sort of the, the breakdown. And again, the notation is just referring to whatever stimulus class we happen to be presenting. So in the training, the participants are gonna be trained on a relationship between A to B. Right. So whatever, whatever that happens to be, then we're going to train on a relationship between B and C, the different stimulus class. Right. So A is one stimulus class. B is another. <clears throat> then we're going to be same B here equals C. Then we're going to uh, conduct probes or tests for the emergent relationships. Right. And there's going to be a couple of them. So if we taught A to B, we might see an emergent relationship that if the sample is B, the learner sees a relationship to A, right? We taught B to C, but the learner may also demonstrate a C to B relationship, right? We taught A to C, or I'm sorry, we taught A to B and then B to C, so the learner may also demonstrate a relationship that A equals C right, A to C, and then of course C to A. So I'm sure some of you are uh, confused at this point, so hopefully some further examples will, will help clarify things. It's, it is really dense material, but if you work with it, you'll, you'll come to understand it. So the three basic equivalence relations that we look for are reflexivity, that is, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between stimuli. That is, A equals A and B equals B, right? So pictures to pictures, um, words to words, whatever, you know, again, whatever the form of the stimulus class is. Symmetry is when stimulus class A is shown to be interchangeable with stimulus class B. We say the organism or the participant is showing symmetry. That is, if A equals B, then B equals A, right? So we're again looking at teaching something and then seeing perhaps an emergent relationship of symmetry. Transitivity is when the organism uh, responds to stimulus class A as if it were equal to stimulus class C. So again, if we teach A equals B and we teach B equals C, then a equals C might emerge as um, a, a derived relationship. The learner has uh, can demonstrate a performance that has not been explicitly taught. Okay, so that's really what we're talking about here. All right, so let's look at uh, <clears throat> a couple different examples and you know, using my, my favorite subject here, cats. Uh, so if we train different relationships Right, that A equals B, so the picture cat uh, equals the word cat, and the word cat equals spoken word cat. Now, now again, I, I want you to keep in mind these are 
individual match to sample arrangements, right? So um, we present the sample of a picture and we require the learner to touch uh, a comparison stimuli out of an array of three, right? So we teach this. Then we teach this. So maybe we show the sight word, the learner has to respond vocally, or we can you know, again do another variation where the, the teacher presents the vocal and the learner has to touch the, pic the, the word or the picture. Multiple permutations we can run. But if we train relationships like this, A equals B and B equals C, we should be able to then test for new relationships, right? So we present B and we see that the learner, B as a, the sample rather, and then we see that the learner can select A out of the array of comparison stimuli. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And then the uh, teacher presents the spoken word, so in this case, stimulus class C, and we see that the learner can select or point to the comparison stimuli of written words. Then we test in another probe that um, when we present the picture of a cat, the learner can um, say cat, or if we present the vocal cat as a sample, the learner can select the picture. So we have these emergent relationships that were derived from the methods we used to teach the relationship. So again, what we're talking about is that the learner kind of simply stated is responding the same way to different stimulus classes because they share some feature. Uh, obviously, they, they share the same meaning or the, the same concept. So we trained two relationships in that example, and we got uh, a couple that were not explicitly trained. So the emergent relationships are one, two, three, and four. So four different relationships emerge by teaching in this, uh, these two different relationships. So again, it's, you could think of it as uh, we're, we're trying to maximize our teaching to produce learning outcomes. Okay, so let's look at some, some other common examples. Uh, again, whenever you see the sample, or I'm sorry, uh, either the sample or the comparison with the, the rectangle, uh, we're gonna uh, imagine that that is a written word on an index card. When we see this, sort of the, the thought bubble, it will represent spoken word, okay? So if we begin by training two stimulus-stimulus relationships, a to B, that is one relationship. The written word cat is presented as a sample and the spoken word cat results in reinforcement. The spoken word dog results in no reinforcement. So you can imagine as you're running through this training procedure, uh, this might just simply be sight word reading, right? If the learner says cat, there's a reinforcement. If they say dog or something else, it's extinction. Right, so this is a simple discrimination procedure, essentially. But we are teaching relationships between written word and spoken word. <clears throat> On other, uh, so we might alternate, right? So that's, this might be trial one, right? Where cat is the SD, right? And um, then the next trial, dog might be the SD. So we're teaching these two different relationships, right? Then contingent on 100% correct responding under the AB conditional relation, we might test for emergent relationships. And the ones, again, we're gonna look for are symmetry and transitivity. So we run some test procedures. We um, <clears throat> run this, the sample as a spoken word cat, and we see if the learner can select the written word cat. Right, then on another trial, we say dog, and we see if the learner can select dog. Now, again, remember, we didn't train that relationship. We train picture, or I'm sorry, text uh, the word dog to the individual saying dog. Okay, now we're, uh, the teacher is saying the word, and we're requiring the learner to select the written word. Okay, so that would be symmetry, B to A. 
Then we can look for other relationships. We say the word and we present comparison stimuli that include pictures. Now again, I'm, I'm only showing two pictures here. Often we'd have an array of three. So the spoken word cat B1 is presented as a sample in this test and the correct response uh, to pointing to the picture of the cat results in reinforcement. Touching the, the pointing to the picture of the dog results in extinction. Okay, so this is a new relationship and we're, we're seeing if the learner can admit this. So once again, teaching um, word to spoken word and then moving to presenting spoken word, uh, looking for correct responding to written word. Okay, and we could train new relationships. <clears throat> the spoken word cat to the picture. Right? Again, going uh, alternating what serves as the uh, SD or the S plus on any given trial, or we should alternate to make sure if we, in this case, if we have two uh, <clears throat> comparison stimuli we work with, each one serves as the S plus on any given trial. Okay, we run our test procedures. We're testing for symmetry. Um, the learner, or can the learner demonstrate that the written word cat um, equals the picture of the cat and that the written word dog equals the picture of a dog? Then we could test for transitivity. We could, we could run through these procedures uh, multiple times and, and look for these emergent relationships. And uh, again, we're, we're trying to organize our teaching Right? If we're using matched sample and we're teaching the learner um, sight words or picture identification, symbolic matching, if you will, um, is there a way that, is there a systematic way that we should be presenting this material that will ensure that we get a greater learning outcome? And in fact, there is. The research bears this out. Now you could get in, into more complex relationships and um, Sidman did, um, well, he's done a lot of work in this area, but <clears throat> one study he points out sort of uh, a variety of relationships that, that can be taught. And in this case, the dotted lines are referring to emergent relations. The solid lines are referring to um, taught relationships. So uh, let me see if I could Follow this, uh, picture names dictated to the student. So this would be the, the teacher saying a, a particular name. Obviously pictures, this was another stimulus class. Um, picture names spoken by student, picture names printed. So this is you know, sight words here. So if we teach these relationships, A to B, right? Uh, dictated name to picture, uh, dictate a name to text or, or sight word, um, A to B, A to C. We should get a variety of emergent relationships that are possible. A B to C relationship, so now we present pictures as a sample, and the learner should be able to point to comparisons that include the written word. Uh, and then you got the opposite relationship. You should be able to uh, show the written word as a sample, and the learner can pick a comparison of pictures. Also, we might see that the learner can uh, emit a picture to spoken words. So when we show the picture, the learner can say cat, right? Or the written word and so forth. So really complex relationships. Now, once again, this is not only a, a teaching methodology that we can use, we can, we can arrange our teaching in such a way to maximize learning outcomes, but it also is sort of an explanation for our own behavior as humans, particularly with respect to uh, behaviors such as reading, uh, responding to symbols, responding to um, uh, speakers. So a verbal behavior we'll, we'll, we'll move into in another chapter, but it does start to account for, you know, if, you, if any of you have been around uh, a young child or a niece and nephew, and seeing them develop from, you know, knowing one or two words to uh, eventually they start saying these things and identifying things that, that have not really been explicitly taught. 
how how do we account for that? And this particular uh, approach or concept helps us account for much of that behavior. <clears throat> the chapter also talks about uh, expanding stimulus classes. So when you add a new member to an established equivalence class by teaching new conditional discrimination. So we could expand beyond the, the classes that we actually taught relationships among. Or we can merge classes, right? So independent equivalence classes can be combined to produce larger classes, okay? And I'm not going to go through this by way of examples, but if you look, uh, review again the textbook, specifically figures uh, 19.6 through 19.9, it gives a nice demonstration of examples of uh, class expansion and class merging. So I certainly spend some time either going through this lecture or going through the reading and get a good handle specifically on the equivalence relationships of symmetry, um, reflexivity, and transitivity. You, you definitely need to understand those. But the other thing I want you to start to think about is, you know, how would we how would we really use this stuff? And there, there are clearly examples in the literature, but in the chapter, tables 19.1 uh, or table 19.1 puts, puts together a nice set of considerations of how to arrange or design an equivalence-based instructional program. So again, I'm not gonna read all of these, you can read them on your own time, but what stimuli will be used and how many, how will they be presented? Will a sample or comparison uh, observing response be required? We didn't really talk too much about that, but that observing response is quite important, we, we find, in, in this type of work, that in order for the learner to benefit from the method of instruction, they really need to be observing the stimuli, and, and particularly when we're working with individuals with autism or developmental disability, where... Um, attention can be a problem, we might find obstacles <clears throat> to, um, to our teaching if the learner is not observing. So observing responses are important. What instructions are given? How do we balance trial arrangements? Remember I said that um, usually there is an array of three comparison stimuli and that each comparison should serve as the sample across trials, right? So trial one, uh, trial two, each will have a different sample stimulus that, that are part of the comparison. Okay, so it goes through how we might, might set up an EBI uh, teaching program. And then the testing considerations. How do we test, right? So you have to imagine um, what we don't know with any individual learner is how, how much training do we have to do? How many trials do we have to go through our matching the sample uh, until we start to see these emergent relationships. And what we, we should use is what is called a probe, right? So imagine it in, in terms of, um, let's just say on a daily basis, we're running you know, up to uh, three sessions of 10 matched sample trials, or however many it, it takes to sort of ensure that uh, each sample is presented an equal number of times and so forth. So Let's just say for the sake of simplicity, <clears throat> we're running through 10 trials, three sessions. Then we might conduct some probes to see and think of it as a test. We're not teaching necessarily, we're testing to see if these emergent relationships have, have been developed. If they haven't, we go back to teaching, right? Uh, then we probe again. So you have to think about how we're going to arrange that. And therein lies sort of... Um, one of the, the, I guess, I wouldn't call it a limitation per se, but one of the difficulties with equivalence-based instruction is I believe it takes an enormous amount of work um, on the front end before you even start teaching. You have to pull together the stimuli. You have to um, <clears throat> ensure that your trials are really systematically designed, right? You have to plan what's going to happen trial to trial. Um, that said, you are starting to see a lot of folks incorporate this into their everyday teaching, and I think the um, the textbook does a nice job uh, pr 
sort of presenting some of those um, extensions. Okay, so there's a lot there. The, the textbook extends into some other areas uh, with respect to transfer of function, contextual control, and so forth. We're not going to review that. I encourage you to read the chapter. Um, but I, I think there's enough here with just stimulus equivalence to, to sort of uh, spend some time with. Um, I will also post these links that, that present, and I really encourage you to watch these. It presents some fun um, applications of stimulus equivalence work or equivalence-based instruction with animals. Uh, I believe they're they're dogs. So, and that might get any of you who have dogs. It might give you an idea of uh, a behavior change project that you want to do. So, definitely watch that. I will post these links. Okay. Have uh, a good week.